Hey, I'm Aubrey. Thanks for joining me. Tonight, I will be reading you chapters one through three from the book Borgel by Daniel Pinkwater. I read this book back in elementary school and it stuck with me. I even kept the library book. Um, probably shouldn't have done that, but I, I really like this book, or I used to. So I'm looking forward to reading this. Um, I hope you are too. I hope this video provides you either entertainment or can lull you to sleep. Either way, I hope you enjoy the next hour with me. Chapter 1 This is how Borgel turned up. I don't remember any of this myself. It's the story the family tells. Nobody quite knew who Borgel was. There was some vague idea of him, but neither my parents nor anybody else could remember having seen him. There was an old aunt in Cleveland, Ohio, who knew all about the family, and who was related to whom, but she had died years ago. There was nobody left who remembered much. For example, no one remembered for sure where we originally came from. I assume it was someplace in Europe, but no one knew exactly where. The family name didn't provide much of a clue. Spellbound. Spellbound is an English word. English, Borgel, certainly was not. Where he came from, I never found out. He had an accent. He came from the old country. That's what he called it. He never said which old country. Borgel turned up one day with 32 large, lumpy, black valises. He brought them in a taxi cab. My mother was home alone at the time. Mrs. Spellbound, he asked when my mother came to the door. My mother said yes, she was Mrs. Spellbound. Congratulations, Borgel said. You are going to be allowed to take care of an old man. God will like you for this. Then he carried his 32 valises up the stairs, two at a time. He refused to accept any help. After he had brought all the valises up to the apartment, he asked if he could have a cup of hot water. My mother was in a state of something like shock. She didn't know who this old man was, and she couldn't understand why she had allowed him to carry 32 large leather valises up the stairs and to send the taxi away. She had even offered to help him carry the valises. No, thank you, Borgel said with an accent. When I have a woman help me carry 32 valises up three flights of stairs, I will lie down and die, which I am not ready to do yet, thanks God. My mother led Uncle Borgel to the kitchen and put the kettle on. Hot water, you said? Yes, beautiful missus, Borgel said. My mother liked that. When my mother poured the hot water into a cup and placed it in front of Borgel, he took an old-fashioned purse out of his coat pocket. My mother thought he was going to offer to pay for the hot water, and was about to tell him that it was not necessary, but what he took out of the purse was a tea bag, which he swished in his cup a time or two, squeezed out, and then returned to the purse. I won't be any trouble, he said. At this point, my mother screamed. She said it surprised her that she screamed suddenly like that. She said that she had felt a scream coming on for a while, and it just suddenly got out. It didn't have anything to do with the tea. What she screamed was, Who are you, anyway? You didn't get my letter? What letter? The letter I sent you. I didn't get any letter. My mother was still screaming. It didn't seem to bother Borgel. So you didn't get the letter. What does it matter as long as I'm here, right? I don't know who you are, my mother shouted. Who are you? Who are you? That's easy, Borgel said. I'm Borgel. I'm your relative. Borgel? Borgel. You're my relative? Yours or your husband's, I'm not clear about which. My mother had stopped screaming. Now she was repeating everything Borgel said. Mine or my husband's, and you're not sure which. That's right, Borgel said. Do you remember the, the old aunt? The one in Cleveland? The one who died? Yes. Well, she probably knew. I never paid attention to things like that. The important thing is that I'm here, right? My mother felt numb all over. Right, she said. A hundred and eleven, Borgel said. A hundred and eleven, my mother asked. How old I am, 
Borgel said. A hundred and eleven years old. I could go any time. It's nice of you to take me in. I have to call my husband, my mother said. Sure, Borgel said. How is he, anyway? Health okay? He's fine, my mother said. Good. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Which is my room? I may as well put the valises away. That was how Borgel came to live with us. There was some more discussion, of course. My father came home from work early, and he and my mother talked with Borgel. Borgel had a little to add. Had little to, had a little to add to what he'd said already, but not much. It appeared that his old apartment, he referred to it as the old apartment in the old building in the old neighborhood, was slated for demolition. Somehow, he knew that we were his only living relatives, so he came to live with us. He wasn't specific about how he was related to us. What's the difference? How am I your relative? He asked. I am your relative, and I am 111 years old, and you have to take care of me. What could be simpler than that? Borgel had already moved the 32 valises into a little spare bedroom at the back of the apartment. There wasn't much more to say. All this happened when I was quite small. I don't remember any of it. At that time, my world wasn't as big as the whole... Uh, my, my world wasn't as big as the whole apartment. I don't remember when I began to notice that Borgel was around. He continued to live in the little room, and he continued to give his age as 111, year after year. I have an older brother and sister, Milo and Martha. They were and are more or less perfect, honor students, extra good manners, religious, boring. I only bring up their names in the interest of accuracy, because I feel I should mention everyone then living in the apartment. Obviously, Uncle Borgel wasn't a standard uncle. He was more along the lines of a great-great-uncle, or a second cousin of my father's grandfather, or something like that. We called him Uncle because that was the best we could think of. It seemed to satisfy him. Occasionally, my parents would have conversations about him. Of course I feel sorry for him, my mother might say. It's too bad they tore down the building he lived in to make room for the new sewage treatment plant, but is this the right place for him? I mean, wouldn't he be happier in one of those communities they have for older people? This conversation would be taking place in the living room. For nearly a hundred, from nearly a hundred feet away, back next to the kitchen, behind a closed door, over the sound of the television, over the sound of Milo practicing the French horn in his room, would come a shout that everyone in the apartment could hear clearly. Fooey. That was a coincidence, of course, my father would say. Of course, my mother would say. And they would drop the subject for another few months. Frequently, Uncle Borgel would not come out of his room for two or three weeks at a time. The second bathroom was in the hall right outside his door, and he could dart in and out without being seen. At least he never was. My mother said that sometimes she could hear a blender working in Borgel's room, and sometimes she could smell cooking. Evidently, he had a hot plate in there. In the beginning, she would worry about Borgel and knock on the door and ask if everything was all right. Borgel would answer that everything was fine and please not to bother about him. He never opened the door. The only member of the household to see the inside of Uncle Borgel's room for the first few years was Fafner, the dog. From the day Borgel arrived, Fafner spent almost all his time there. Uncle Borgel would open the door a little and let Fafner out when it was time for a walk. That is, when Borgel didn't take him himself. When Fafner came back, he would sit outside Borgel's door and whine until he was allowed in. On a couple of occasions, I remember hearing growling and scuffling and happy barking coming from the room. They were wrestling. My mother reported to us that while everyone was away at school and work, Borgel would come out of his room. He would have his hat and coat on. He and Fafner would go out for two or three hours. When they came back, Fafner would appear to be tired. My mother thought they were going for long walks. One night, Borgel appeared in the living room where we were all watching TV. He pulled a straight chair into the middle of the room and sat with his back to the set. My mother said hello to him. He bowed from his chair. She asked if he would like a cup of hot water, tea, or perhaps a cookie. No, thank you. I just had an eggplant, he said. 
One Saturday afternoon, maybe I was 10 or 11, I ran into Uncle Borgel. I was just hanging around, not doing much of anything, when Uncle Borgel suddenly appeared. He had a way of doing that. One second, he would not be in the room, and then he was. Okay, sonny boy, he said, answer me this. What is an eft? It's a lizard, isn't it? I said, like a salamander. Okay, Borgel said. Now, what is a wok? That's a Chinese frying pan. Pretty good, Borgel said. Now tell me please, Mr. Smarty Pants, what is a rock? It's a big bird, I said. Sinbad the sailor met one in the, big, in the story. Bingo, Borgel shouted and handed me a dime. Then he went to his room. The next day, I received a letter. It was an invitation. To Mr. Melvin Spellbound, you are invited to visit me in my room after supper tonight. Borgel. Wear a tie. I later got to know that one could only visit Uncle Borgel's room by invitation. Walking up and knocking on the door was no good. The invitation might come hours, minutes, or weeks in advance. It would read, You are invited to visit me in my room at 7 o'clock on the 1st of June and wear a tie. The invitations always ended with, Wear a tie. When I visited Uncle Borgel with my tie on, for the first time, I found him sitting in a room crowded with valises and suitcases, the ones he had arrived with. They were all made of dull, scuffed-up black leather with bumps on it. They were stacked almost to the ceiling, and I could see more of them through the partially open closet door. In addition to the suitcases and Borgel, there was a bed, two chairs, an empty bookcase, and a framed photograph of a man with a bushy beard wearing a big cowboy hat. There was nothing else visible in the room. Apparently, Uncle Borgel kept all of his possessions in those suitcases and took things out as needed in them putting them away afterwards. Hello, Melvin, Uncle Borgel said. Would you like a cup of Norwegian Volmos tea? I've never had any, I said. So you'd like to try it, Uncle Borgel said. He opened a valise and took out an electric hot plate, a couple of cups, and a kettle, which turned out to be already full of water. He put the hot plate on top of the bookcase and plugged it into the wall socket. It will be ready in a few minutes, he said. Sit there. He pointed to a chair. I sat. Good. Now, a surprise quiz, he said. Huh? I said. Wait for the question, Uncle Borgel said. No guessing. Besides, huh is not an answer. First question. What is an asp? It's a little snake, a poisonous one, I said. Hooray! Ten points for that one, Uncle Borgel said. Now the second question. What is a boa? A boa is a big snake, a boa constrictor. Right again. You didn't make an asp of yourself that time. Here comes a tricky one. What is a fry? Take your time. I took my time. A fry is a baby fish? <laughs> Whoopee! You got them all, Mr. Genius. A perfect score. Borgel dug out a dime and handed it to me. Excuse me, I said. Why do you do that? Do what? Only ask questions about three-letter words. I don't know. I just happen to like three-letter words today. There are a lot of big topics with only three letters. God, for example. And art. And bugs. Bugs has four letters. Bug, then. Look, the water is boiling already. I'll get the teapot. Uncle Borgel took a teapot from the suitcase, shook some horrible-looking gray leaves into it, and poured in boiling water. There are more kinds of bugs than anything, you know, he said, except stars in the three-letter sky. I couldn't decide whether the Norle Norwegian Volmos tea tasted more like v moss or vol, never having tasted either, to my knowledge. It wasn't exactly bad, but it was very strange. The Laplanders drink this like Grepis Cola, Uncle Borgel said. It's good for the brain and other muscles. What's Grepis Cola, I asked. It's the 75th most popular soft drink in the world, Uncle Borgel said. 
That interested me. I like topics like that. I already knew the 20 most popular soft drinks in the world. I thought I would make a point of asking Borgel sometime what the other 54 were. Okay, Uncle Borgel said. Now it is time for the musical entertainment. I hope you like music. Sure, I like music, I said. You like Beethoven? I'm not sure, I said. Classic musical was a... Classic? Classical music was a topic I didn't know very much about. Nobody in the family cared much about music, classical or otherwise, unless you counted Milo, but he only played French horn in the high school band because things like that are supposed to look good on your college application. He already wanted to become a dentist and drive a German sports car. I don't think he was any good as a French hornist. Beethoven is a first-class genius, Uncle Borgel said. He's maybe as good as the human race can produce. If you listen to the music he wrote, you'll find out things about yourself. If you listen to music by Beethoven a lot, you will never become stupid, unless you already are, in which case there's still no harm in it. <laughs> Uncle Borgel got a radio out of, this, out of a suitcase. It was made of wood. He unplugged the hot plate and plugged in the radio. There was a friendly light in the dial, like a Christmas tree light. This will take a minute to warm up, he said. I watch the newspaper to see what's going to be on. Tonight, they are playing Symphony No. 5. It's just right for a boy who doesn't know Beethoven. It's exciting. You'll probably like it. He was right. It was exciting, and I did like it. The music made me feel the way I did when I watched certain adventure movies. Better, in a way because the feeling was inside me instead of being connected with a story on the screen. While I listened to Beethoven's Symphony No. 5, I also got to like the Norwegian Volmos tea. When it was over, I asked Uncle Borgel, Would you invite me the next time something by Beethoven is going to be on? Of course, he said. I got to be invited to Borgel's room more often than anyone else in the family. My parents were practically never invited. Milo and Martha visited him occasionally, but they appeared to regard it as charity, being kind to an old man, part of their perfection program. I doubt that Borgel had much fun with them, but he'd invite them from time to time so they could feel virtuous. I visited Borgel at least once a week. We listened to the radio, drank cups of Norwegian Volmos tea, and had discussions about all sorts of things. I would also go for walks with Borgel and Fafner. He liked to walk at a fast pace for 15 or 20 blocks. It was hard to keep up with him. It was difficult to believe he was over 100 years old. Of course, Borgel saw the rest of the family, even though they didn't visit him in his room very often. He would pass through the apartment on his way out with Fafner, and at long intervals he would join the family in the living room, always sitting with his back to the television, it turned out that he disliked television because the people in the pictures appeared so small. He said it gave him the willies. I wasn't able to find out from Borgel where the old country was. He would never say. I had developed a theory that it was one of those countries that don't exist anymore, like Bosnia or Herzegovina. Borgel only referred to it as the old country. It didn't seem likely that he had forgotten. He didn't appear to ever forget anything. He'd say things like, see this button? It's a bone button. I remember when all buttons were made of bone or shell, sometimes wood. There weren't any plastic buttons until Matthias Klopmeister invented a celluloid button making machine in 1883. Someone who remembers who made the first celluloid button making machine and when isn't likely, forget, likely to forget where he was born. But Borgel never mentioned the place by name. Melvin, Uncle Borgel said to me. Some details are important, and some details are unimportant. I pay attention to the important ones. I asked him if the history of button making was important. Of course buttons are important. Next to zippers, buttons are among the most important inventions of mankind. Imagine how much trouble getting dressed and undressed would be if you had to deal with strings and pins and knots and such. I asked Borgel what some of the other important inventions of mankind were. He said they were underarm deodorant, window screens, long playing records, and Chef Chow's hot and spicy oil. 
I liked it very much when Uncle Borgel would let me come, come with him on visits to the old neighborhood. The old neighborhood was where Uncle Borgel lived before he came to live with us. He lived in the old apartment in the old building. Chapter 2 The old building wasn't there anymore. In fact, the old neighborhood was hardly there anymore. It was mostly a bunch of vacant lots. The apartment houses had been torn down to make way for a new sewage treatment plant that was never built. They tore down the old building with the old apartment in it, filled in the basement with bricks and rubble, and left it that way. Uncle Borgel didn't leave many traces, assuming he was born in some defunct country like Herzegovina. It was interesting that he should have most recently lived in an apartment that wasn't there anymore, in a building that wasn't there anymore, in a neighborhood that wasn't there anymore. It isn't exactly accurate to say that the old neighborhood had ceased to exist entirely. There were still a few buildings standing, and the main business street, Nemo Boulevard, was not quite dead. That was where Uncle Borgel and I would go when we visited the old neighborhood. Uncle Borgel said the old neighborhood was the only place in town where you could get a bottle of Chef Chow's hot and spicy oil. It's one of the essentials, ingredients, in most of the cooking Borgel did. He bought a bottle of Chef Chow's hot and spicy oil at least once a month. I asked him why he didn't buy it by the case and save trips. He told me he liked to go back and visit the old neighborhood, and besides, it would be dangerous to keep many bottles of Chef Chow's hot and spicy oil together in one place. Safety first, he said. Another thing Borgel liked to do when we visited Nemo Boulevard was go to the Star Spangled Banner All-American Cafeteria. The Star Spangled Banner All-American Cafeteria was Uncle Borgel's favorite place to hang out. It was a place where not a word of English was ever heard. And whenever we went there, he would have two or three glasses of coffee. They served it in thick, barrel-shaped glasses. Uncle Borgel would put a lot of milk in his coffee and stir it with a spoon. He would also eat a rhinoceros roll. A rhinoceros roll is an ordinary hard roll. In some places, they call them Kaiser rolls, or Kimmelwicks, or stale O's. At the Star Spangled Banner All-American Cafeteria, they called them rhinoceros rolls. When we went to the Star Spangled Banner All-American Cafeteria, we would usually meet Uncle Borgel's friend, Mr. Raspel Newtspicky. Mr. Raspel Newtspicky was a very old, was also very old. He claimed to be even older than Uncle Borgel, but Borgel said he was probably not even a hundred yet. When they met at the cafeteria, they would speak in some strange language. It was unlike anything I've ever heard. It sounded as though they were clearing their throats, but they were communicating. I asked Uncle Borgel a trick question, hoping to get a clue about where he had come from. Is the language you speak with Mr. Raspel Nutzbicki the language you spoke in the old country? No, Mr. Raspel Nutzbicki doesn't come from my old country. Is his old country anywhere near yours? I was still hoping to get some information I could use. I could look up Mr. Raspel Nutzbicki's old country in an atlas and see what countries were nearby. His country was next door to mine. I was really getting somewhere. What is the name of Mr. Raspel Nutzbicki's old country, I asked. Uncle Borgel made a sound. At first, I thought he was preparing to spit, something he did better than anybody but I realized he was saying the name of Mr. Raspel Newtspicky's old country. How do you spell it? In English? Yes, how do you spell it in English? You can't spell it in English. Mr. Raspel Newtspicky wore a thick black overcoat, winter and summer, and he smoked horrible cheap cigars. He also wore thick eyeglasses and a funny slouch hat. He and Uncle Borgel would alternately talk and listen. I would sit, sipping my coffee and nibbling my rhinoceros roll, and wonder what they were talking about. Another reason I liked to go to the old neighborhood with Uncle Borgel, in addition to sitting around in the Star Spangled Banner All-American Cafeteria with him, was that I liked the stories he told on the bus. Sometimes he'd tell true stories from his own life about climbing a mountain in Asia, or being a cowboy in Brazil, or sailing in the South Pacific. 
Other times, he would tell a story about some criminal and how the police caught him. Halfway through many of these stories, I would realize it was the plot of a television program the family had watched the night before while Borgel sat with his back to the set. Very often, he'd tell stories from the old country. They were nursery stories or folk tales. They were all about animals. At the end of each story, he would pause, and then he'd say, Moral, and then he'd tell the moral. Here are some of his stories. The Story of the Rabbit and the Eggplant Once upon a time, there was a race between a rabbit and an eggplant. Now the eggplant, as you know, is a member of the vegetable kingdom, and the rabbit is a very fast animal. Everybody bets lots of money on the eggplant, thinking that if a vegetable challenges a live animal with four legs to a race, then it must be that the vegetable knows something. People expected the eggplant to win the race by some clever trick of philosophy. The race was started, and there was a lot of cheering. The rabbit streaked out of sight. The eggplant just sat there at the starting line. Everybody knew that in some surprising way, the eggplant would wind up winning the race. Nothing of the sort happened. Eventually, the rabbit crossed the finish line, and the eggplant hadn't moved an inch. The spectators ate the eggplant. Moral, never bet on an eggplant. The story of the mole that thought it was a fox. There was a mole that was unusually large and beautiful for a mole. It was stronger and faster than all other moles. It decided that it must not be a mole at all. A terrible mistake has been made, said the mole. I have been raised as a mole when all the time I have been a fox. The mole told all the other moles and all the other animals that it was really a fox. Is that a fact? said all the other animals, none of which had ever seen a fox. One day, a real fox passed through the part of the forest where the mole thought that thought it was a fox lived. I am a fox, said the mole to the fox. Well, you sure are an ugly one, said the fox, and continued on his way. Moral, who cares? The story of the fish that thought it was drowning. <laughs> Sorry. A fish in a forest pool called out to the animals that passed by, Help! Help! Help me out of here! I'm drowning! An elk spoke to the fish. You're not drowning. You are a fish. You live in the water. If you were to come onto dry land, you would die. Oh, said the fish. Moral, don't listen to anything a fish says. <laughs> the moose and the squirrel. In olden times, everyone, everybody knew that the moose was a great trickster. The moose always played jokes on the other animals and cheated them and got them into trouble. So when the moose came upon the squirrel who had collected a great number of nuts for the winter, the squirrel resolved to have nothing to do with him. Oh, squirrel, said the moose, why don't you let me put all of those nuts of yours in my pocket? I'll take them wherever you like, and you won't have to run back and forth with one nut at a time. Oh, no, said the squirrel, you'll play some sort of trick on me. No, I won't, said the moose. I'll just put your nuts in my pocket and take them wherever you say. Oh, no, you'll cheat me, said the squirrel. No, I won't, said the moose. Oh, no, said the squirrel. You'll get me into trouble. No, honestly, said the moose. I just want to help you. Really? asked the squirrel. Sincerely, said the moose. All right, I'm going to trust you, said the squirrel. You may put my nuts in your pocket. I just realized, said the moose. I don't have a pocket. Let's forget the whole thing. Moral. Animals are stupid. Of course, stories like that would have appealed to me much more when I was a lot younger, but I still liked to hear Uncle Borgel tell them. He was a good storyteller. He'd imitate the animals, and sometimes, if he was telling about a squirrel, for example, he'd get up and hop around the bus imitating a squirrel. He got really into the spirit of whatever he was telling. Sometimes everybody on the bus got involved.
Chapter 3 One night, Uncle Borgle tiptoed into the room I shared with my brother, Milo. We were both asleep. Uncle Borgle pressed a flashlight and a scrap of paper into my hand and then tiptoed out. I switched on the flashlight and read what was written on the sheet of paper. Come to my room in one hour. Get dressed and carry your shoes in hand. Also, bring some extra clothes, a spare shirt, underwear, socks. Don't make any noise. Borgle. Tie not necessary. I waited until the luminous hands of the alarm clock indicated that three quarters of an hour had passed. Then I got up, dressed in the dark, rummaged around for some spare clothes, and carrying my shoes in hand, made my way through the dark apartment, apartment to Uncle Borgel's room. Come in. I went in. Uncle Borgel had on his hat and coat. He was sitting on his bed with one of his lumpy leather valises on his lap. Thanks for coming, he said. I just wanted to say goodbye. Where are you going? I asked. I thought I'd take Fafner with me. It would be too cruel to leave him here. He wouldn't understand. You, you're, you're going? Yes, going. I didn't know what else to say, so I said, Why did you ask me to bring these extra clothes? It's cold in the apartment. I thought you might want to put them on. Do you want to put them on? No, I don't want to put them on. If you're tired of holding them, you can put them in this valise. He opened the valise. Here, put them in the valise. I put my clothes in the valise. Well, Uncle Borgel said, I will be going now. Come, Fafner. Wait, I said. You're just going to wander off in the middle of the night? I mean, just leave? The truth was, I was a little worried that maybe Uncle Borgel had gone crazy. I couldn't just let him wander off like that. If you're going, I'm going with you, I said. That's okay by me, Uncle Borgel said. I'll wait while you put your shoes on. I laced my shoes, grabbed my coat from the coat tree in the hall as we passed it, and followed Uncle Borgel in his long black coat and broad-brimmed hat, carrying his black lumpy leather valise, and followed by Fafner, down the stairs, out of the building, and into the street. This was my situation. I was out in the street in the middle of the night with the family dog and my sort of great uncle, who was at least 111 years old. What it amounted to was that we were running away from home. It was very strange. I had overheard conversations between my parents about the possibility that Borgel might go soft in the head sometime. This didn't seem to be very likely in Borgel's case. He always did the crossword puzzle with his leaky fountain pen in under two minutes. Once I got him, as a present, a book of the world's hardest crossword puzzles. He did them all in about a half an hour. Borgel could also figure in his head faster than I could work my father's adding machine, and he could juggle five balls. Still, it seemed very odd, this taking off in the middle of the night. Probably the right thing to do would have been to wake up my parents and tell Uncle Borgel, tell them Uncle Borgel had gone crazy and was running away. I couldn't do that. He was my favorite relative. If Borgel was going to run away, the only thing to do was to run away with him and see that nothing bad happened to him. I, myself, had no particular reason to run away from home. I wasn't mistreated or anything of that kind. On the other hand, it occurred to me that there was no strong reason not to run away. I was fairly bored by my family, except Borgel. There wasn't anything better to do. But it seemed to me that I was entertaining foolish thoughts. After all, how far could we get? It would probably all come to nothing within a couple of hours. Borgo was making his way along, peering at the parked cars. He was sort of mumbling to himself. I considered offering to carry his valise for him, but he never allowed that sort of thing. We went a block, turned the corner, went another block, turned another corner. We were going around the block. <laughs> Borgo was obviously confused. Maybe he had gone soft in the head after all. He continued to peer at parked cars. I couldn't imagine what he was up to. Then he put down the valise, opened it, and took out a length of stiff wire, a straightened-out coat hanger. He worked the wire into the window frame of a beaten-up old sedan, fished around, and caught the door-lock knob with the hooked end of the wire. It only took a few seconds. Get in, he said. Fafner jumped in. I followed. Uncle Borgel had broken into a parked car. 
Now he was fiddling around under the dashboard with another piece of wire. This time, it was insulated electrical wire. He was hot-wiring it. Uncle Borgle was a car thief. Sure, that's the only way. <laughs> Suppose the police caught you and threw you in jail. Uncle Borgle, are you sure this is a good idea? Sure, it's the only way. Suppose the police caught you and threw you in jail. Ah, <laughs> hypothetical question. So what? What could they do to me? Give me life in prison? Besides, I'm a cute old man. No court in the world would convict a cute old man. Anyway, I haven't done anything to get arrested for. Haven't done anything? What do you call... Shh, I have to concentrate. Uncle Borgle felt around, felt around under the dashboard, poking with his piece of wire. Suddenly, the engine turned over. Borgle smiled. That's got it, he said. The engine was coughing and sputtering. Borgel stamped, st stamped on the gas pedal. The car vibrated and lurched forward. We were moving. We were criminals. I was an accessory to grand larceny. I knew this because I had watched a lot of police shows on the TV. Grand Theft Auto was what I was an accessory to. A felony. I thought you could get about seven years for that. Not being a cute old man, I figured they'd throw the book at me. I wasn't feeling very happy. Uncle Borgel obviously was. He was singing as he drove. Uncle Borgle had often cautioned me not to be a wimp. He was the opinion he was of the opinion that the rest of the family had wimpish tendencies and had warmed me against falling into those ways. I bring this up because I do not want to give the impression that I was unaware of the thrills and excitement available to persons who have committed Grand Theft Auto. I appreciated that we were taking a lot of risks, and I could see that it was a sort of adventure but my thoughts kept returning to the prospect of getting caught and thrown into prison. The old sedan chugged onto the interstate, and in 15 minutes or so, had worked up to a cruising speed. I was thinking that if one commits Grand Theft Auto and then crosses a state line, it becomes a federal cr crime, and one stands a good chance of being machine-gunned by the FBI. I considered working this into the conversation, but I couldn't be sure whether it would have the effect of discouraging Borgel or just making him happy. Fortunately, there wasn't much traffic on the interstate at that time of night, just the occasional convoy of trucks, which would shoot past us and be out of sight in two minutes. I began to cling to the hope that we would get so far away from the scene of our crime that nobody would be looking for us. When we got to a city, I'd persuade Borgel to dump the car, and we'd go home on the bus. Oh no, the state line was coming up fast. We'd be across it soon. This was it. The big time. Professional crime. It was going to be death in a hail of bullets for me. Melvin, look in the glove compartment and see if there are some whole wheat fig bars in there. I had to hand it to Uncle Borgel. He was a cool one thinking of fig bars at a time like this. I opened the glove compartment and rummaged around. A super yeast candy bar, raisins, anything you find in there, Borgel said. I'm feeling hungry, and I don't want to stop until we've burned up this tank of gas. I found a cellophane bag of whole wheat fig bars and passed it to Borgel. Care for one? he asked. Maybe later? I said. I was examining something else I'd found in the glove compartment. It was a plastic folder containing a card. It had Uncle Borgel's picture on it. I could read the card by the light of the tiny bulb in the glove compartment. It said that the car was a 1937 Dorbzelj sedan, that it had four cylinders and weighed 5,307 pounds, and that it was owned by Borgel McTavish. McTavish was Borgel's last name, not that he was a Scotsman. McTavish was as close as any English-speaking person could come to pronouncing his last name, which sounded nothing like McTavish, but even less like anything else. This is your car, I said. Borgel sprayed whole wheat and fig crumbs all over the dashboard. Naturally, it's my car. What did you think, that I stole it? Well, why did you break, it with a coat, break in with a coat hanger and start it without a key? Because I lost my key after I had the car about a year, and then the country where she, w she was made went out of business, so I couldn't get a new one. How about this car? Forty-five years I've had her and never changed the oil once. She's a honey. Honey was making about 40 miles per hour and white clouds of smoke. 
I took a bite of whole wheat fig bar and settled back against the seat cushions. This is the life, Uncle Borgel said. The open road, a good machine, and a whole wheat fig bar. By the way, see if the dog will eat one of those. I offered Fafner a fig, a fig bar, which he accepted without enthusiasm. He didn't like the food that got stuck in his teeth. This is the life, all right, I said. By the way, are we going any place in particular? Yes, we are. Do you feel like telling me where? I feel like telling you a story from my life. Will we be gone long? That depends on what you call long. We'll see. I was just thinking about my parents. I left them a note. Oh, that's good. What did the note say? The note said, Melvin and I have gone away. We took the dog. Don't anybody go in my room. Love, Borgel. That should do it, I said. Sure, Borgel said. It sank in. We had really run away. Borgel, my 111-year-old super great uncle, or whatever he was, and I. There are some bottles of natural honey sweet and ginger beer in the back, Borgel said. See if you can reach a couple. I hung over the seat back and felt around. Under Fafner, I found a brown paper bag that clinked. I reached in and fished out two bottles of ginger beer. What do I do with these? I asked. Give them here, Uncle Borgel said. Pardon my teeth. With his teeth, he pried the cap off one of the bottles and handed it to me. He did the same with the other bottle and spat out both caps out the window. I was impressed. The natural honey sweetened ginger beer tasted good and sort of burned my lips. I liked the sensation of, of hurtling along in the old Dorbzelge, driving through the night with Borgel and snacking on good things. How come you never mentioned having this car? I asked him. There are lots of things I've never mentioned. I don't use this car for little errands, just for big road trips. That's why she's lasted so long. When was the last time you took a road trip? 1946, Borgel said. I ended up in Yellowstone. Are we going to Yellowstone? I wasn't planning on it, but you never know. We'll see. Some interesting things. That's for sure. Going to drive all night? Until I get tired. You can go to sleep if you want to. I'm not sleepy. So I'll tell you a story from my life. Uncle Borgel didn't say anything. Okay, I said. Okay, what? Okay, tell me a story from your life. I'm picking one out. More silence. Do you mind if I play the radio? Go ahead, I'm still picking. I turned the knob. A green light behind the dial came on. Give it time to warm up, Borgel said. In a minute or so, I could hear static. I twisted the turning, tuning knob. I found a station. A man was talking. He sounded like someone. He sounded like Borgel's friend, Mr. Raspel Nutzbicki. He was speaking this, that same language. Hey, I said. Short wave, Uncle Borgel said. This car's got everything. He's talking in that same language you speak with your friend. No, he's not. That's French. That's not French. You can speak French? No, but... So how do you know it isn't French? Because it doesn't sound like French. The announcer has a cold and a Canadian accent. He's talking French. You can believe me. I know a lot. It didn't sound like French. It sounded exactly like Mr. Raspel Newt's speaky. Borgel's mind was made up. There was no point in arguing with him. On the other hand, he could have been right. I was getting pretty sleepy. At one point, I thought I heard the announcer say something about the Star-Spangled Banner All-American Cafeteria, but by that time I was already drifting into sleep as the Dorbzelge thundered along the highway. Okay. Okay, what? Okay, I've picked the story from my life, the one I want to tell you. I shook myself awake. Okay, tell it. Okay, so here goes. Long ago in the future, in the galaxy of Witzbilb near Terextein, Long ago in the future? Who's telling the story? Be quiet and pay attention. Sorry. Long ago in the future, in the galaxy of Witzbilb near Terextein, a planet with five moons on a little planetoid, no bigger than a gob of spit in this vast and expanding universe, there was a moment. A moment? That's right. This story is about a moment? Absolutely. <laughs> a 
a moment, like a moment in time, right? Right. Now, to continue, this was a happy little moment that had never done anybody the least harm. This moment, whose name was Dennis, played with the other little moments, romping and gambling and never a care in the world. Little Dennis never suspected that he would become a moment in history. Of course, he already had, because this is a story of the future told in the tense of the past. Would you mind if I went to sleep now? This isn't holding your interest, is it? I'm nodding. Okay, how about if I told you the true story about how I became a time tourist? A time tourist? What's that? It should really be time, space, and the other. That's the element in which I'm a tourist. But time tourist sounds better. It could be a story on TV. Borgel, the time tourist. Borgel, the time tourist and his amazing adventures. The amazing adventures of Borgel, the time tourist. Welcome to another thrilling episode of Borgel, Tourist in Time. A watch company could sponsor it. The makers of Psycho Watches brings you another episode of Borgel, the time tourist. Hello, I am wearing the Psycho 640 kilobyte digital watch, just like the one Borgel, the time tourist, uses. It runs in all directions and underwater and at temperatures of up to 16,000 degrees centigrade. And you can hit it with a hammer and you can leave it in the freezer. You can spit on it. You can stomp on it. Nothing's going to hurt this baby. Bullets. You can shoot at it. Acid. Magnets. Vibrations. So what's a time tourist? I'm one. I'm a time tourist. Me. Yes. Yes. As I said, it would be better to say space-time and the other tourist, because it isn't only time, you know. What's the other? Ha! That's easy, sunny boy. It is that which exists in neither time nor space. It's the best part of being a time tourist. I had, I had read some stuff along these lines, and I had seen plenty of science fiction on television, so this sort of thing was not new to me. Neither was it new for Uncle Borgel to incorporate plots of television shows into the stories he told me. The way to enjoy this was to play along. So, what do you do when you're a time tourist? I asked. Well, the first thing you need is a vehicle. The Dorbzulge is a first-rate time, space, and the other machine. The next thing, if you really know what you're doing, is to have some good traveling companions. You and Fafner have the makings of the very best fellow tourists. So, I'm a time tourist too. You are now. What else do we need? Just the willingness for it to happen. That's all. The willingness for what to happen? The willingness to leave one time, space, and the other continuum and enter into another. Are you willing for that to happen? Sure. You've got to be really willing. You can't just say so to be polite. Are you really willing? You really want to take the trip? Yes, I really want to. Okay. We've got everything we need, and we're started. Whoopee. The night sky was clear and full of stars. I looked at Uncle Borgel. He was happy. There was a big smile on his face, and it was possible to see a few of the stars through his head. That's neat, I thought. Uncle Borgel is sort of translucent. I held my hand up in front of the windshield and looked at some stars through it. They were dimly, but plainly, visible. Ha-cha! Uncle Borgel shouted. Time, space, and the other, here we come. I came all the way awake. Wait a minute. I can see through my hand. What's happening? You have a problem, Mr. Adventurer? Uncle Borgel asked. I can see through my hand. I'm transparent. What's going on? Relax. It's normal. It's not normal. I can see the stars through my hand. Sort of neat, wouldn't you say? Borgel asked. Except that it's terrifying. What is this? Now, don't be a weenie, Borgel said. What kind of time tourist do you call yourself if you get all excited just because you see a few stars? I'm seeing these stars through what I hope is solid flesh, and I want to know why. Why? I don't know exactly why. It's something that happens when you travel very fast through time and space and the other. It was sinking in. Borgel wasn't just telling me a story from television. We really were traveling through time and space, or something of the kind. I was squinting through the palm of my hand at stars, and it was like looking at them through a pair of sunglasses. What else happens? Tell me everything. 
all sorts. Sometimes we become completely immaterial. Sometimes we turn into heat, sound, light, all sorts. It's fun. This is dangerous, isn't it? This is no more dangerous than eating ice cream. I felt a little better. In a hot air balloon, in, in a high wind. I felt a little worse. Don't worry, Uncle Borgel said. I've been doing this sort of thing for maybe eight or nine hundred years. It's a snap. You'll get used to it. What do you mean, eight or nine hundred years? It's just a guess. I lost track of myself a long time ago. You're telling me that you're eight or nine hundred years old? Older? You can't become a time tourist where I come from until you're all grown up. You're lucky you don't come from there. From where? From the old country, where you have to be all grown up before you can take, become a time tourist. <laughs> there aren't many boys your age uh, that have an opportunity like this. I feel sort of sick. The fig bars didn't agree with you? Have another swig of the ginger beer. Uncle Borgel, I'm not following this very well. Maybe you'd better start from the beginning. Sure, we got plenty of time. A story from my life. You're comfortable? No, I am not comfortable. I am confused and scared, and I can see through my hand. Not to mention, through your head. Up until a few minutes ago, I was under the impression that we were riding along an ordinary road in an ordinary stolen car. Now you tell me that we're traveling through time, space, and the other, and that you're more than 900 years old. None of this makes me comfortable. Well, you seem to have all the facts straight. Maybe I can help you feel a little better about this if I tell you some history. Uncle Borgel, anything you can do to help will be greatly appreciated. Fine, now settle back, look at the nice stars through your hand, and I'll tell you everything. The first thing you have to understand is that time is not like a string. Time is not like a string. Some people think it is. It isn't. It also isn't like a series of frankfurters, a loop, a figure eight, a fast train, a fast train with a mosquito in it, a melting ice cube, a floppy pocket watch, a French cookie, rotten apples, silly putty, or Swiss cheese. No? No. So? So, time is like a map of the state of New Jersey. Not like the state of New Jersey, or even the state of New Jersey seen from the air, or from a satellite. It is like a map of the state of New Jersey. Got that? Sure. Okay, next is space. Space is sort of like a bagel, but an elliptical one with poppy seeds. You got that? Got it. Time is like a map of New Jersey. Space is like a bagel. Good. Next is the other. This is the hardest to explain. The best I can do is that the other is like a mixed salad in which there is only one ingredient you like. Now, one more time. Time is like a map of New Jersey, space is like a bagel with poppy seeds, and the other is like a salad with only one thing you like in it. I repeated. Excellent. Have a fig bar. Now I can get on with the history. Am I allowed to ask questions? Certainly. Why is time like a map of New Jersey? A good question. This is why time is like a map of New Jersey. Let's say you are in Newark, New Jersey, and you want to go to, oh, let's say Perth Amboy, New Jersey. You don't know where exactly Perth Amboy is. What do you do? I look at a map. Precisely. You look at a map, and the map shows you what roads to take to get to Perth Amboy, or Hoboken, or Elizabeth, or anywhere in the state. Now here comes the big question. If you were in Newark and you were thinking about Perth Amboy, would Perth Amboy exist? Sure. Right. Now, let's imagine you're still in Newark and you are not thinking about Perth Amboy. Would it still exist? Yes. And if you had never even heard of Perth Amboy and weren't thinking about it, would it exist then? Yes. How about Jersey City? Same thing. Correct. It is exactly the same thing. So, Mr. Professor of Philosophy, all the towns and cities and places in New Jersey exist, whether you know about them or are thinking about them or not, right? Right. Trenton? Yes. Housebrook Heights? Yes. Weehawken? Yes. Cape May Courthouse? Is there such a place? 
there is, then yes. So there you are in Newark, and all the other places even exist. Uh, all the other places exist, even though you are not in them. See? I do. The same thing with time. All the moments in time exist, even though you're only in one of them. I get it. You do? Sure, it's easy. I was getting sort of excited. The points in time extend in all directions, and even though we can only know about the them one by one, the others are all there. Perfect. Now, if you left Newark and went to Munachi, would Newark cease to exist? No. And if you wanted to go back to Newark, would it still be there? Probably. You're an intelligent kid. So, so if you have the means to do it, I said, you can go back and forth from any point in time to any other point in time because they're all always there and it works out to be like a map of New Jersey or some other state. Wrong. Not some other state. Just New Jersey. Why not other states? They're the wrong shape. <laughs> While Borgo was telling me this, I was noticing that the road beneath us was starting to glow. The road is starting to glow, I said. That's normal, Borgel said. Only a couple things you need to understand before I can tell my story. You know about space? You mean outer space, planets and all that, I asked? Space, inner, outer, near, far, solid, and immaterial. The distance between stars and the distance between an ant's ear and his hind foot. Space, you know about it? I know it exists. Good enough. You're a smart boy, Melvin. I'm glad I brought you with me. You know what is it? You know what is it? Light years? That's the distance it takes light to travel in a year. So, if we wanted to go to some galaxy that's 50 million light years away and could travel at half the speed of light, it would take us how long to get there? I don't know how long. Too long. That's how long. That's space. But if you can move through time and space, both at once, and you sort of hit it diagonally, you can, in effect, get from Newark to Hoboken in about three seconds. That's how we travel in time and space. Sort of like a warp, I asked. Oh, -ho -ho. we know who's been watching television, Uncle Borgel said. Yes, that's the idea. So you should also remember from Star Trek that if we change the angle a couple of degrees, we can leave Newark in the 20th century and hit Hoboken in the 18th. You still with me? Still with you, I said. By this time, there was no physical sensation of moving forward. Road vibrations, engine and tire noises had ceased, and the Dorbzelge was completely silent. The road was now a glowing, milky white, and to the sides of it was blackness. The only thing that told me we were moving was an occasional amphorous, amorphous blob of light sliding past us. It didn't look anything like space travel or TV or a video game. What really surprised me was that the windows were still open. Are we traveling in time and space right now? I asked Borgel. Full speed ahead, Borgel said. You know the windows are open. So, are you cold? I mean, is it all right for them to be open? Stick your hand out and see what happens. I stuck my hand out. It vanished. That is, it ceased to exist as I put it outside the car. I drew it back and it reappeared. That's spooky, I said. Isn't it? Borgel said. Now are you ready to hear the story of how I became a time tourist? One more question first, I said. How does this Dorbzelge work? Has it got a phaser drive? Has it got a warp drive? Has it got improbability drive? It's got high dramatic, Borgel said. It says so right in the middle of the steering wheel. Hey, are you still awake? If you are, thanks for listening. That concludes the first three chapters of Borgel by Daniel Pinkwater. Please like or subscribe if you enjoyed the video and want to hear the rest of the series. Hope you have a wonderful night. Bye-bye.